Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome. My name is Patricia Anderson, and I use she, her pronouns, and I'm pleased to be your producer for today's first Monday's webinar, which today is co-presented, actually, by PSG Consulting and Innovating for the Public Good, R&D for Democracy. We're really excited to welcome all of you today, and especially to welcome some new friends to the audience, including journalists, um, political operatives, for lack of a better term, researchers, um, and folks who care about uh, this very important issue. As you're joining us today, I'm just giving a few brief housekeeping remarks, and then we will be getting right into the presentation. We really encourage and welcome your participation. We just ask that you use the Q&A box, which somebody has already done. And yes, we will be sharing the recording after this. Susan, thanks for the question. This session is being recorded and it'll be posted on PhD Consulting's website a little bit later this week. If you've registered for this webinar, you'll receive an email reminding you that the, um, that the recording is ready. Once again, please direct your questions and comments to the Q&A at any time. We'll do our best to get to as many of them as we can. We thank you for joining us today, and I'm going to turn it over to our host, Paige Gardner. Thanks, Patricia, and welcome, everyone, and thanks for your time. As Patricia said, this presentation is a project of PSG Consulting and Innovating for the Public Good. Innovating for the Public Good was launched in November, and it is a bold new effort to create fundamental change with disruptive new strategies and innovations aimed at strengthening democracy and its institutions in both the short and long term. We are all focused on 2024 and its immediate danger. And as Michael Podhorzer said uh, in his Substack recently, the 2024 election is not a contest between two politicians, Joe Biden and Trump, but a de facto constitutional referendum. We are up against a long-standing, well-coordinated drive to restructure the United States into a country where there are fewer opportunities, more restrictions on our rights, harder times for working families, and a loss of national unity and purpose. Traditionally, our focus has been on immediate threats and opportunities that occur every two years. We go from cycle to cycle, understandable, but the result is that we are losing the long game. So a focus on long-term fundamental change that nonetheless contributes to each cycle is the work of innovating for the public good. So many smart strategists and pollsters have taken note of a particular group of voters and their potential to change the results of 2024, particularly given their size. Some call them dual haters, we label them double negatives. Estimates of the size of double negatives range from 15 to 25%. Whatever the size or the label, these voters were decisive in 2016 and 2020. So we need to be able to target these voters much more precisely. So working with Target Smart and Jeff Guerin, the team built a one-of-a-kind model that identifies these double negatives. With this new model, we can target subsets of these voters with nuanced communications that achieve specific and varied goals. Now, let me turn it over to Tom Bonnier and his team to go into this work in greater depth. Tom. Paige, thank you so much. Um, it's so great to be here with everybody uh, on this Monday, I guess now afternoon. Um, before I jump in and share the data that we have, which is some super exciting data, um, I just wanna offer some thanks. First, thanks uh, to Paige and her team for pulling this project together. It's an incredibly important project. It's been an interesting project to work on. And we're confident that what you're going to see is something that's going to make a difference uh, in this election. So uh, thank you for that. Um, wonderful to be able to work with, with Jeff on this. And then big thanks to our team at Target Smart, the work they've done uh, on this project. So with that, I'm gonna jump in. I don't know if others can see the first slide. I just see a PowerPoint logo. Um, Not just yet, but it's okay, coming. Perfect. Um, awesome. So um, we'll jump right in. We can go right to the, the next slide. Thank you so much. Um, this is just a little bit of overview here in terms of this project. This is a very large sample survey um, across a sort of expanded battleground states. It's all of the traditional battlegrounds. I think we would always think of Then Maybe there are a few on here that um, we wanted to get data from to get uh, a, a good uh, set of responses that would allow us to, to build this model um, 
everywhere with with high accuracy. It's why you see like uh, Montana in there, New Hampshire, Ohio. To, important bearing that in mind because I'm going to share some of the survey responses first and some of what we learned from this. Then I'm going to hand it over to Danny, who's going to share the real important stuff, uh, which is actually talking about the model itself. So, again, talking about this process, it was important that we took a multimodal approach do everything we can to eliminate the sort of response biases that you would generally see in any one mode. So you see we had live phone calls, text to web, and then online panel responses. 4,305 registered voters, again, across those states conducted over uh, the middle to end of January. So this is uh, still a fairly recent data set. Uh, and then there's a lot in the methodology here. And by the way, for those of you who have questions, uh, of course, you can ask them here. For those of you who want to discuss this in any further detail beyond this conversation, you'll have my contact info and Danny's contact info shared uh, in the chat, I believe. And so please feel free to follow up because I'm not going to dig too deep into the methodology here. Okay, we can jump to the next slide, please. So I'm going to share some of the sort of high level results that we found the survey. It's obviously a, a pretty rich data set with over 4,000 responses. As Paige said at the outset, when you look at the estimates of the double haters or dual negatives or whatever you want to call them, nationally, the estimates have been between 15 and 25%. What we found in this survey data set, sort of right in the middle, just about one in five uh, registered voters uh, have an unfavorable opinion of both President Biden and Donald Trump. And I will say, and, and, and Paige really cued this up in her intro, um, but there is a very fundamental notion to this project, which was when we look at this race, which I think we all reasonably should expect to be a very close and competitive election, uh, we can take those who have a favorable opinion of one candidate or the other and set them aside with a very high degree of certainty that those people are going to vote for the candidate of whom they have a favorable opinion. In fact, the, the survey data, even though we don't have a slide on that, actually bears that out. It's almost a 90% margin each way, where if you feel good about President Biden, you're almost certainly voting for him and the same for Donald Trump. So we're able to establish this battleground of voters. It was important for us to engage in this process process to be able to learn more about them. You know, when we first looked at this, we tested a bunch of different theories. Could we just use existing partisan models or candidate support models and say, can't we just take the people who don't score high for either of them? Well, what you'll see, and Daniel will walk you through this, is they're actually very nuanced, different audiences. So um, it's really exciting. You'll see this in the data here in terms of what we we're able to pull out. So one in five, of all registered voters across these battleground states um, or had an unfavorable opinion of both Biden and Trump. You look at this, this little bubble above each of these, this shows the party ID of that group. So what's that, that saying is Democrats had a net party ID advantage among dual haters of 4%. Very narrow uh, lean towards Democrats. Um, if we looked on the next one, both very unfavorable. So about one in three, a little bit more than one in three of these um, uh, dual negatives um, have very unfavorable opinions of both candidates. So that's the predominant position, though, just barely. This group, again, and you'll see a very symmetrical distribution of these groups in terms of partisanship. They lean slightly, ever so slightly Republican by two point margin and party ID. When you look at the group that only feels slightly unfavorable about President Biden, but very unfavorable about Donald Trump, as you would expect, that's an overwhelmingly Democratic group, plus 53 Democrat and party ID. And again, it's the next biggest group. So as we're beginning to paint the picture here, you see this group. There are more of these voters who feel so-so about President Biden, but very negative about President Trump, plus 53 Dem. Again, that's one in three of um, the dual unfavorables. Uh, next, 4% uh, of the uh, the all registered voters fall, fell into this category where they're very unfavorable uh, about President Biden, somewhat unfavorable. And so again, you see that sym symmetrical distribution. They were very Republican, uh, minus 58 Democratic. And then finally, the last column in the smallest group there were those who had a somewhat unfavorable 
uh, opinion of both of them. And again, party ID is just about even. Okay, we can jump to the next slide, please. Okay, so uh, this is actually looking at the head-to-head, -head, of course. This is the thing that we all focus on for better or for worse, I would say for worse. Uh, but we're going to go over some of this because it does actually illuminate some important things in the data that I think are helpful in understanding the model and I think helpful in understanding the application of the model. So when you look across these battleground states, uh, again, keeping in mind this is all registered voters, this is not just likely voters, we find Donald Trump with a three-point lead. Um, it's a bit of a flip when we look at self-reported 2020 vote history, where um, among these voters in these states, President Biden, unsurprisingly, um, won this group. Uh, and you see a very substantial third party vote here. 16% third party, uh, RFK Jr. leading the way with 8% of the vote. We can jump to the next slide, please. We've got a little bit more uh, on this breakdown. So here... Now we're actually isolating just these uh, dual unfavorable uh, voters. And so you'll see that uh, President Biden does have a lead among these voters, which is good news, though. Uh, you know, as Paige has said, and, and certainly was the case in 2020 and 2016, these voters have been decisive. President Biden's lead among understanding that they were not the same voters in 2020, though there might have been uh, overlap, had a larger lead. So he has a two point lead. Certainly what jumps out here is the fact that 42%, so a plurality of these dual unfavorables are selecting a non-major party uh, choice. Uh, and again, perhaps unsurprisingly, among them, lead among them, RFK Jr. with 20%. So he's within, uh, or, or at least very close to margin of error uh, to President Biden and Donald Trump and the support he's getting here. Okay, we can jump ahead to the next slide, please. Okay, so this is, we 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 asked, you know, we didn't just ask the favorable, unfavorable horse race questions, of course. Um, it's a very rich data set, again, with over 4,000 respondents. Uh, one of the batteries of questions we got sort of looked at uh, different attitudinal predictors. And so I'm going to go through each of these. First one was a category where people would agree with the notion that neither party represents their interest. So only 4% of registered voters actually held this opinion, but 12% of dual negatives did. So unsurprisingly, it basically indexes by a factor of three, um, more so among the dual negative voters. Um, and again, when you look at uh, the breakdown in the horse races here, it's not surprising that you see, again, third-party candidates doing better. A couple of things I want to highlight without reading out all the numbers on here. Again, you can certainly come back to these. And I believe the presentation will be available online for folks who want to um, you know, come back to this conversation. A few things that'll jump out to me. Um, the intention not to vote, not intending to vote. You see those numbers are all in double digits across all four of these categories. Neither party represents their interest, people who are not following the news closely, people who believe that the president doesn't make any difference, or people who believe that Congress makes no difference. So again, the highest in terms of um, not intending to vote is people who believe that neither party represents their interest, but frankly, all of these are very high, very close, um, certainly compared to the overall universe of voters in this group. You see double digit undecideds across all of these, except neither party represents their interest, which is just on the verge there. And then, you know, interesting to, to me, I'm not going to spend a, a ton of time on Cornell West's um, uh, support group here, uh, given that he's at 3% overall, but certainly bears some attention that he takes 17% of voters who say neither party represents their interests, whereas he's basically at his um, sample wide average among all of those other statements. Um, somewhat interestingly, though, I don't want to read too much into it, is the fact that President Biden has a nine point lead among people who say president makes no difference. I'm not sure what to read into that. Uh, OK, next slide, please. 
So um, this is looking at some of these key groups. And again, we'll get into more of this. This is really just sort of the tip of the iceberg. Um, you know, when you have a sample with over 4,000 respondents, you built a very robust model on it and you have a lot of interesting data. I think we had over a thousand pages of cross tabs. So I promise you, we are not going to go through nearly that. I, I have a few more slides and then Danny's going to get to the real interesting stuff here in terms of the model. But this was something else that we selected that jumped out. When we look at who the dual unfavorables are, you'll see some of the over-indexing stats I'll share in a minute. But, you know, again, unsurprisingly, a lot of uh, the, the dual uh, unfavorables index younger. And so when you look at these key groups, so we'll start with independence uh, under the age of 50. Um, 24% of the overall universe, 40% of uh, dual negatives. When you look at the head-to-head, -head, uh, President Biden is down 14 points among these younger independent voters. Uh, and it's one of JFK Jr.'s strongest groups, uh, again, where he gets into the um, the double digits at 13%. You see similar numbers, again, not as um, strong in terms of... Um, the margin between uh, the candidates, but certainly over-indexing across these groups. Again, you're seeing younger voters almost entirely, single respondents, uh, younger Black voters, um, and Hispanic women, again, um, across all these groups with uh, significant numbers in the dual negatives universe. All right, we can go. I think I've got a couple more slides here, and then we'll turn it over. So this, I'll take one second to explain what this is because it's a, it, it might be a little bit opaque, but it's actually really valuable data. And I think once you get the layout of this, it, it, uh, it makes sense. So what these numbers are showing is the extent to which any one of these cells is over indexing across, um, the sample, um, meaning are they more or less likely than their representation in the sample would suggest. So the higher numbers means they're uh, over-indexing, the lower numbers mean they are under-indexing. So for example, if you look at that first column, what should jump out at us is that bright red 3.44 under Jill Stein. So what that's saying is that uh, sub suburban younger women are almost three and a half times more likely to be voting for uh, Jill Stein than the universe overall. So that's incredibly stronger group for the next strongest group, uh, urban younger women. Uh, what's interesting when you look at RFK Jr. We've seen this across the data. I was um, digging in this morning through the the full set of cross tabs, and a lot of his support is relatively flat, at least compared to some of these other groups, meaning he's drawing from sort of a cross-partisan and demographic uh, uh, groupings. Uh, you know, his his worst indexing group is rural older men. Uh, his best indexing group in here is suburban younger women, same as Jill Stein, just uh, not quite as much. Again, you'll see different groups. Cornell West is over-indexing here. His strongest groups uh, overall, urban, younger men, urban, younger women. So younger urban voters. Uh, undecided uh, younger women in um, urban areas, most likely, or most over-indexing to undecided. Um, and then finally, the last column here, don't intend to vote. Again, you're seeing urban, younger women over indexing and saying that uh, they're more likely to say uh, that they don't intend to vote, uh, followed by rural younger women. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. All right. So, same sort of um, uh, breakdown here, but looking at some um, different categories. So, and this is the great thing about having a very, very large sample size is we're able to dig into some of these categories that you wouldn't otherwise be able to with any level of confidence. Although some of these, we didn't have enough sample size, which is where you'll see them blanked out. But again, Jill Stein seeing a, a pretty substantial uh, over indexing among um, uh, younger Asian men. Um, when you look at the do not intend to vote, uh, young black women, um, over indexing by a very significant uh, margin, younger black men, 
um, very, very close to those numbers. Uh, older Hispanic men, very much over indexing on not intending to vote. Um, and younger uh, Asian women also over indexing substantially on um, not intending to vote. So we see some of the concerns that are arising from this data in terms of um, not just the sort of double hater, dual negative perspective, but also just concerns around vote intensity and likelihood to vote. Understanding that here we are um, still several months out from the election, but in terms of the work that lies in, ahead of us, uh, you know, a lot of that is clear in this data set. All right. I believe that is all I have. Yeah. So I'm going to hand it off to Danny, who uh, has done incredible work in building this model uh, and is going to share a lot of the details in terms of uh, how he did it and what it means. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Danny um, with the Targets Private Analytics team. Really happy to be here and talk about some model building with you. Uh, so I'm going to spend a good portion of my time on this slide because it's it's some of the key decisions that go into uh, what we actually did in terms of building this model. Uh, and uh, it all starts with uh, des designing a uh, training class for the data. So we took this survey data that uh, Thomas walked through and we uh, divided it into a yes class and a no class based on whether or not someone is a voter that we wanted to target with this model. So we're looking broadly at these double negative, dual hater, whatever you want to call them voters. Uh, but a, a bit more broadly than that, we're trying to find voters that are uh, upset with the top choices that they have for precedent, but are, in our judgment, potentially winnable for uh, Joe Biden and for other Democrats. So uh, we're, first of all, pushing out into the no class, uh, everyone that we're calling a standard partisan. So those are people who have a favorable opinion of one or the other party or both, uh, people who are definitely voting for either Joe Biden or definitely voting for Donald Trump. Um, and there's about 3000 of those in the sample that are going right into our no class. Uh, and then we're including into the yes class, people who say they are uh, very unfavorable or somewhat unfavorable of both candidates or both major parties. Uh, so that's uh, basically the, the the central logic of this uh, model class. We want to include everyone in our yes prediction class. We want to find people who are upset with uh, both parties. That said, though, uh, when we're looking at this, we actually don't want to find people who are uh, somewhat negative on Donald Trump and very negative on Joe Biden. And we don't want to find those people because they're basically Trump voters. They're Trump voters who are a little frustrated with Donald Trump. They're Trump voters who might stay home and not vote, but they're very unlikely to be Biden voters. So that's not the sort of people we want to contact here. Similarly, uh, we're including third party candidates and people who are supporting third party candidates in our yes class. Uh, except for we don't want to target people who are telling us that they're they're going to vote for Chase Oliver. Uh, because again, perhaps they'll choose to vote for Chase Oliver in the general election. Perhaps they'll choose to vote for Donald Trump. Perhaps they'll choose to stay home. In our judgment, they're pretty unlikely to choose to vote for Joe Biden, which means that even if we target them, even if we campaign to reach them well, we're probably not going to reach them. Uh, we're probably not going to uh, convert them. So that's the major construction of this, this main model that we have on here, the leftmost column, this disaffected Democrat model. Uh, while we were doing this, we also put together a disaffected Republican model to kind of target exactly the same thing on the other side. Uh, we don't expect that to be the primary use case uh, for, for anyone on this call. Uh, there will be some ways that we think that that, that model will help with targeting that I'll get to in a little bit. But if you only take away one thing from this presentation, it's, it's that the disaffected democratic model is the, the, the one that we want to focus on. Uh, so this slide, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. This is kind of just the, a, a bit of the technical details. This is a bit about how we build our models and what we get out of it. So we use a tool called gradient boosted modeling, which is a decision tree classifier. 
Uh, it, and what we get out of it is an individual level score from zero to 100 for every single person on the voter file. And that score is supposed to represent the likelihood that uh, someone belongs to the yes class that we just defined. So in general, that they're someone who is upset with their choices and is potentially winnable for Joe Biden. Uh, we scored everyone on the voter file, uh, and uh, uh, that's basically the how you use this as, as an individual level score. Uh, when we went through that process, uh, the, the modeling tool tests a th uh, over a thousand different possible contributory variables and finds the ones that are most predictive of the results. Uh, and uh, these are the top seven variables for the two models. I'm not going to walk through what each and every one of these means. Uh, we'll have release notes that goes into a little bit more depth about this and also includes some validation statistics and distributions and all that good stuff. But what I, what I want to call out here is a couple of things. Um, sometimes when people talk about these voters, uh, they ask the question like, when we uh, are doing outreach to them, are we basically reaching out to low turnout voters, low participation voters? And I have two responses to that. Uh, first of all, this is going to be a presidential election. Lots of people with relatively low turnout score, relatively low average participation will be voting. Not everyone, but a lot of people will. Uh, and secondly, when we actually built the model, turnout score did pop. It is in an, a, a variable that informs uh, the, the final score of the model. But that relative importance column you see here is roughly uh, the, the share as a percentage of the predictive power of each of these variables. So that means roughly 93% of the predictive power of the model co comes from variables that are not our presidential general term score. Uh, people uh, point to the same sort of question about partisanship. Isn't this basically a model of people with middle range partisan scores? Uh, well, again, party registration pops here. It appears in one form or another in both of our two models that we built. Uh, but as a relatively low share of the actual predictive power of the model, there's a lot else going on here. A lot of uh, interactions from from different variables on our file that that we're, we're finding some some predictive power in, uh, and then the other thing that I would say about using mid range values on a, a partisan score or a support score, so those models are very well optimized to find people who identify as Democrats and find people who identify as Republicans. And uh, if someone has a mid range score in that model, what it actually means is we aren't certain whether or not someone is a Democrat or Republican. We just don't have the data to tell us whether they are or not. That might indicate some uh, middling political ideology, but the data actually doesn't tell us that. It just tells us that there's not enough of information on our file to confidently say that they're a Democrat or Republican. This model, on the other hand, is specifically targeted to find people who uh, are upset with both of their choices. And uh, we think that that there's there's going to be a lot of additional predictive power given by building a model in this way. Uh, so now I'm going to walk through one particular use case for these two models um, it, using uh, the possible swing state, likely swing state of Michigan as an example here. So the way you typically use any sort of predictive, individual level predictive model is you find either a top or bottom share of the electorate that you want to target for that model. In this case, let's say that we're trying to reach out to people that we're reasonably certain uh, fall into this disaffected Democrat category. So we might say we want to target about 30% of the electorate. Maybe this is a large direct mail campaign targeting that. So we would find the cutoff for records that have uh, uh, that that would give us about thirty percent of the electorate in above that cutoff. In this case, it's Michigan. In Michigan, that cutoff would be sixty three point two. We would take every record with a score of sixty three point two or higher, and that would be the beginning of our target numbers. Uh, you can certainly use this in conjunction with other variables in the voter file. Maybe you're only interested in disinfected voters who you also think are very likely to be Democrats. In that case, you would pair this with a support model uh, and say that we want people with high support scores and also high disinfected Democrat scores. 
uh, maybe you're interested in only targeting a specific race or a specific age of people, again, you can add those filters when you're building your lists as well. Uh, and then once we have this universe of our uh, top 30% disaffected voters, we might, for example, use the uh, other model we built, this disaffected Republican model, to uh, separate that larger universe into different sub-targeting groups. Uh, the thought here is that if someone is winnable for the Democrats and also winnable for the Republicans, you might want to talk to them in a different way than you would talk to someone who is winnable for the Democrats, but we don't think that for the Republicans. Now, I'll, I'll pause here to recall back to the class design slide and point out that most records in our training data set were assigned to the same class in both of the two models. So these two models do produce scores that are pretty highly correlated with each other, but they're not exactly the same. There, there is some variance between the two. Uh, and we think that there, there's information to be gained from that variance, that people with a, a high Democratic, disaffected Democrat score and a low disaffected Republican score probably think a little differently, probably are differently persuadable than someone who has a high score on both. Uh, and that's actually the end of what I have prepared. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier that we'll have release notes coming out that have more detail about the distributions. They'll have charts like this one here uh, in multiple swing states so that you can, you can know what sort of records that you have to pull without finding the percentiles yourself. And then I'm going to pass this back to Tom so that he can talk a little bit about where to find these models and how to use them. Uh, and then we'll open the floor up for questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Danny. So um, the exciting thing about this, uh, and again, thanks to, to Paige and her team for pulling this project together and making this possible, is that these models will be on the target smart file. Oops. I should start my video. Apologies. Thank you for the reminder <laughs> that will be on the target smart file. So if you have access to that data, if you're interacting with it in any way, um, you will have access to these model scores and, um, and everything related to that. So I'm going to hand it over to Jeff just to talk a little bit in terms of his, his thoughts and some of the utility of, um, what we've built here. Great. Thanks, Tom. And, um, great work by both Tom and Danny, uh, been terrific working with them. Uh, there's already been, you know, a lot of good polling research about the double negatives um, and their importance to the election. It's pretty clear that they are going to be the um, deciding votes and what I think is likely to be a very, very close election uh, state by state. And um, and, you know, we could, uh, in our surveys, we certainly can look at um, people who are unfavorable to, to both candidates. And we do, and we'll try to look at the messages. But then there is the, you know, challenge of, um, of, of kind of finding those people and communicating with them in a direct way. And uh, this model really provides an opportunity to do that. Uh, you know, it's not a, a surprise that there are a lot of voters who are kind of weighing their concerns um, about each candidate against each other. And, uh, and, yeah, and from a campaigning perspective, I think, you know, what our main um, imperatives are to kind of, you know, in the first instance, to m maybe relieve some of the doubts and concerns of the dual negatives um, uh, about uh, President Biden uh, in terms of uplifting their understanding of the big changes and the big accomplishments he's been able to achieve um, uh, during his uh, term as president so far, uh, but also to just add much more weight to, um, to the concerns voters have about uh, Donald Trump. What we find in our research is that people have a general sense that um, Trump is a bad guy. That he uh, and um, but often it's expressed in really in personality terms. People don't adequately remember 
all the reasons they disliked him as president, not just because of the way he conducted himself, but because of what he did. And um, and we're also seeing very clearly in our research um, that that voters don't uh, understand nearly to the degree they should or that we need them to how much more extreme and how much more unhinged Donald Trump has become uh, since he's less uh, left office and how much more dangerous he would be um, uh, if he had another a chance at the presidency. And um, so this, we have to, it, it's imperative that we tell these voters both sides of that story, the, the positives on President Biden and these kind of the, with more clarity, the the dangers of Donald Trump. And I, to me, what's exciting about the, the model is that uh, it provides an opportunity for uh, campaigns and, uh, and, uh, and other entities to find the voters who are most important to communicate with uh, in these terms. And there can, there, you know, I, I think from a polling perspective, it also just allows us to define uh, universes. Uh, you know, we can look at these universes first to make sure that the model is giving us the voters we want to have, that they are in fact dual negatives who are kind of up for grabs, uh, double negatives who are up for grabs. But also, uh, you know, for people who are scoring high in the model, what are the various kind of specific messages? Uh, and I really kind of love the fact that, that you know, that, that, that uh, uh, Tom and Danny have built this in a way that lets us look, um, you know, very specifically at voters who are uh, open to uh, supporting a Democrat and adding that partisan dimension to the this idea of the double negatives. So uh, I see that you have a lot of really um, uh, good questions about all of this. Um, I'm delighted that they are mainly for Tom and Danny, and um, I'll let you have at it. So thank you. Thanks, Jeff. And before we turn it over to Patricia to open it up for questions, I want to key off of something that Jeff just said, which is hopefully in the next stage of this research project, we do want to do specific surveys of these people that we've modeled, both actually both focus groups and surveys, so we can provide another set of very rich data for people to use. Now with that, I'll turn it to Patricia. Thanks, Paige and Jeff, Tom and Danny. We do have some terrific questions from our audience. They're really smart in my humble opinion. And what I'd like to do is um, actually start with um, some of the questions that I think will help clarify things before we get into the more thoughtful and projecting questions that y'all are gonna take a great shot at answering, but also say, we're not sure, we need to collect more data. Um, so let me start with this one from Morris. Uh, Morris asks, with your multimodal survey and your rich data set, Tom, do you have a situation where you get more responses from people who are more interested in politics? So in other words, have you um, a somewhat self-selected sample? Yeah, and, and actually, Jeff, despite you do trying to dodge the bullets, this is a good one for you, uh, certainly as well. But yeah, I mean, you're obviously going to over-index on... Um, on on people who are more interested in politics but i think when you look at the data set and you see the number of people who say that they actually aren't paying that close attention we have some interesting questions where we asked about media consumption how closely are you following the news and there's a significant portion of the respondents who just aren't that tuned in who aren't really paying attention to the news you know there's a i saw another question here so we might be able to to, to um, handle two questions at once about there's the self-report on one of the slides of vote intent and someone noted that that's a very low percent and likely only you know maybe 150 respondents Th that's a little bit and again jeff can speak to this in his experience and and all the the polling they do you know we're generally not relying heavily on self-reported vote intent other than it's just one more data point for us to to view um this universe through meaning there are a lot of people who based on 
our turnout turnout models and their past turnout history, we know are um, either very unlikely to vote, won't vote, haven't voted in previous elections, um, that allow us to get enough of a sample size um, uh, to be able to have confidence in the conclusions of the model and of the data we're sharing today. But that's the nice thing about these model training data sets too, is when you're collecting over 4,000 respondents, you can get a whole lot of those people who just love to take surveys. And then frankly, we have to work harder to keep going back and getting more responses of those lower propensity individuals. But we do have a lot of them in here. Before I turn, turn it over to Jeff, just one other um, quick follow-up. We actually went back in the field for, and Danny, I think it's about another thousand responses-ish. About that, yeah. Um, and so we have another data set that Danny and his team are going to be looking at, both in terms of a validation perspective and if things line up, potentially even um, adding a little bit more nuance uh, to these models. You know, this will be, as any analytic product and data product should be, an iterative, uh, living, breathing co component of our campaigns going forward, meaning um, as it exists today. We only seek to improve it going forward as we collect more data. But Jeff, I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts in terms of the lower propensity voters. Well, I, I would say that the reason that Paige spent extra money to have do this with a multimodal approach where the interviews are coming from, you know, outbound phone calls and text to web invitations as opposed to just taking people off a of panel is that it is a way to get more um, uh, less engaged voters into the sample. That is a kind of a panel only approach. Um, uh, people who are used to taking surveys um, are a little bit more limited than that. Although you set quotas, um, but you know, the, the data collection for this particular uh, project was designed in a way to enhance the ability of Target Smart to get lower propensity, low interest um, voters into uh, the sample and into the model construction. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, a couple more questions just about the mechanics of the model and the surveys. Um, Martin is wondering, did you ask voters by religion and not only ethnic group? I know, Tom, you said there's tons of cross tabs, so I'm thinking you just pull the ones to share today. Yeah, well, th so the benefit of having the data match back entirely to the Target Smart voter file is we have thousands of data, thousands of data points that we can then view the survey results in the context with without asking the question, meaning we have models on religiosity. Basically, there's something that interests you um, as far as a more granular look at this data, um, odds are it's on the file and we can provide that context. Danny and Jeff, I don't think we asked a religious demographic question in the survey though, is that correct? I don't, I don't see it either. So I think you're correct there. Okay, great. Um, Danny, uh, did you find out what proportion of the voters voted for Biden in 2020? I think Tom said you you did have that info, but I just wanted to ask that specific question from Nancy. Uh, what proportion of the uh, the dual hater voters voted for Biden in 2020? I think yep. we can find that. Uh, I actually, I believe it's 45-29. It was 45%. Biden, 29% Trump, but you should definitely fact check me on that, Danny, because <laughs> we're showing it Biden plus two. I believe it was Biden plus 16 in 2020. Now, keep in mind that self-reported 2020 vote among these people. So you'll hear numbers. You know, I heard a lot of this as people were as people were digesting the New York Times survey over the weekend, quoting numbers of what percent of the double negatives Biden won in 2020, that would be of the double negative universe as it exists in 2020, which again, there'll be significant overlap, but it's not the same audience, which is part of why we did this project. But yeah, right, Danny, yeah. if you if you find that, that, that would be a good thing to confirm. The electorate is constantly changing, so. It sure is. Okay, cool, thanks. Um, let me pull, let me just make sure I've gotten all of the basics here before we move on to some other questions. Well, while you're while you're looking, I would just say that. Go ahead, Jeff. That you know there there are double negatives in both 
uh, electorates, but it, it is, frankly, it's just harder to be the incumbent with double negatives than to be the challenger with double negatives. And so we're kind of in a, in a different situation. And I think our, our lift is heavier, but, um, but more important in some ways. Got it. Okay, one last uh, technical question from Kate. Um, Kate is wondering, does the quote unquote life stage clusters include a parenting stage or is it just age ranges or something else? So that variable uh, is a uh, it's, it's a composite of age ranges and uh, uh, purchasing data and a number of other consumer variables that that is actually maintained by one of our partners, um, which means that we don't have uh, uh, complete breakdowns uh, of everything that goes into informing their uh, data. It is itself a model that that then breaks down people into different clusters by uh uh what's the uh, our partner views as different relevant life stages but we found in the past that it has uh, very strong predictive leverage in a number of our models and we validated it against some internal data sets as well great um okay i'm gonna shift us to some of the more predictive questions that are asking you to make some conclusions and recommendations from this data. Um, I'm going to start with um, Finale or Finale. I would love for you to teach me how to say that so I can get it right for next time. Do you have a sense of how this model could impact down ballot races or did you really just focus on the presidential? Uh, yeah, uh, th that's a, a, a great question. Uh question and so the the obviously in terms of the model training set it's based on um the you know the notion of dual haters dual negatives in the context of the presidential race but in terms of the application to down ballot races as we think about you know basically anywhere uh, from senate and congressional races to further down ballot um my belief is that this model will have pretty substantial utility in those races in terms of identifying where the work needs to be done, certainly from a persuasion perspective and also potentially from a mobilization uh, perspective when you look at that that first component of the model that Danny was talking about, looking at the democratic element of it where we recommend um, applying the, the majority of the focus. Um, so, so yes, and you know the point that Paige made I think um, driving home a point that I, I believe Jeff made, um, this is the first step. And so I would like for people to be able to take this data, view it in the context of um, field data they are collecting, polls that they are fielding, looking at focus groups. We'll certainly be doing that with the work we do to confirm um, uh, uh, the data's ability to be useful in those races. But again, my sense is they'll have significant application just because of the polarization that we're experiencing um, at the moment. They're not going to be a, a whole ton of voters in a lot of races that will be um, crossing over in terms of people who have a favorable opinion of Donald Trump and are voting for a Democrat down ballot, if that makes sense, or vice versa. Can I uh, just... Uh, Go ahead, Jeff, and then I'll jump in. That um, that first that the model does include people who are negative to both parties as opposed to both candidates, so there is some applicability here. But I do think that um, that uh, that the presidential race, in a kind of unique way, is about a choice between two people as opposed to two parties, uh, and most down ballot races, unless they're very high profile. Um, are much more about the, 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 the often about the two parties. I think in a lot of our races, we we need uh, you know, where we have incumbents seeking re-election in redder states. We need it to be about two people uh, much more. But um, uh, but here, I think you know this model is you know really important at 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 a presidential level because you know while party is obviously very crucial the kind of the feelings about these two individuals and the concerns that voters have about each of them are uh, play a really important role in shaping um, voters thinking about what they want to do in November. 
And so uh, it is, kind of, you know, a different proposition than a, a down ballot race where, you know, in, in a lot of down ballot races, if you kind of know who's um, either who's uh, an independent or who's a unmotivated Democrat, you already know a lot about who you need to be targeting. Uh, this goes to a point I made earlier, which is this is why we want to do another round of research on these double negative you know, voters and see exactly and get data behind uh, exactly what their choices would be down ballot. So I think that's a it's an excellent question. And it's one we want to explore. Thanks, Paige. Um, I'm going to put together, oh, sorry, Danny, go ahead. Just quickly circling back to an earlier question uh, on uh, uh, among dual double negative voters, recall 2020 presidential election vote, Tom was absolutely spot on, 45% Joe Biden, 29% Donald Trump, 6% Joe Jorgensen, and 20% did not vote in 2020, at least that's what they're telling us in their recall vote. Yeah, and can I add... Um... Um, just something on those numbers in terms of, I think Jeff touched on this, but in terms of looking at the 2020 vote versus the 2024 vote, you know, I spent, like I said, a, a, a very exciting morning going through a lot of the cross tabs, a thousand page cross tabs, and really comparing the 2020 recall vote to the 2024 horse race numbers, not just among the double negatives, but across the universe. And I, I do want to say just in terms of being clear about where we are, um, and, and, and perhaps bringing some hope, uh, in, into the conversation is you look across all of these important groups and it's very rare where you're seeing Donald Trump actually outperforming his 2020 vote. In any case, what you're saying in terms of reduced margins is more president Biden underperforming. In a lot of cases, Donald Trump is underperforming as well. Um, but to the point that Jeff made, a lot of this is just due to the difference of incumbency uh, in four years. And you're seeing this, especially among these lower information voters where the president just becomes sort of a convenient lightning rod for anything that they're unhappy about as we're further out from the election. So um, it's just a, in, an important note, I think we look at, even though the number shift from 45, from plus 16 to plus two, I think there's a reason to believe a lot of that is soft based on just lower information voters. Not to say that there isn't significant work that needs to get done, but it's work that we should be hopeful um, and, and confident that we we can do and that this model is going to help us identify the right people who, who need that work the most. Great. Thank you, Tom. Okay, so we have just under 10 minutes left. We have a lot of really terrific questions and I, I don't think we're gonna to get to all of them. So what we'll do is try to answer as many of them as we can um, in writing in our follow-up email. So please everybody keep an eye out for that. Um, and thanks so much for your engagement today. Um, I've got one more sort of technical question and then I, I wanna leave you all with um, a prompt for some final thoughts before we wrap it up. Um, so the folks that do not intend to vote, did you get a sense or did you ask whether they don't intend to participate at all or if it's specifically the presidential? Um, I know I've been hearing folks are planning to vote down ballot but not top of the ballot. Um, and also just pointing out there's 245 days between now and election day, so a lot can change. Um, but tell us more about about the double negatives, stool haters. What is fueling what do, what did you learn is fueling their um, desire to just sort of tap out and not participate? Okay. Uh, Jeff, do you want to take that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there there really wasn't you know the survey wasn't designed the survey which uh, Tom and his team conducted wasn't really designed to sort of dig into that, I think okay. we can. Uh, so I, I don't think we have a survey based answer from the Target Smart Research. I think you Fair can, uh, I, you know, uh, I think you can, you know, make some reasonably educated guesses about why they, people uh, don't think they'll vote right now. But, you know, for, I think one of the uses of this is um, to identify voters who, if they did vote, would vote Democratic or vote for President Biden, who aren't feeling very 
motivated to vote at all right now, um, who, who don't think it, you know, the election makes much of a difference or that the, the absence of what they think of as good choices means the election really doesn't make much difference for them. Um, and uh, understand how to build a case with those voters that um, uh, that highlights the stakes of the election and um, makes these unmotivated Democrats um, um, uh, more inclined to vote and understand, you know, why their vote can make a difference. Thanks, Jeff. Um, you anticipated my closing question. So is there anything more you want to say about uh, what you think we should try to do with this information or is, you feel like you've you've said your piece? No, I mean, like one, you know, the, I think that there are a lot of polls that show that that third party voting is, um, you know, is is a ha, has the potential to put a bigger burden on on the arithmetic for President Biden than on 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 Trump. 40, and just a reminder that 42% of the voters in the, uh, in the, who are the double negatives are currently inclined to vote for third party. And, you know, I, I, I think part of what we want to be thinking about in terms of a use case for this data is uh, finding those third party voters and, and moving them, uh, you know, to back to President Biden uh, as much as we can. And, if um you know if they they would if they were going to move they'd move to president trump we we may want to understand how to keep them as third party voters and as well thanks jeff so tom and danny for you same question it's a amalgamation of a lot of audience questions which is you know do you have recommendations about what we or the progressive community at large can and should try to do with this data, given the time that we've got to, I, I mean, I see is there's an opportunity to encourage and win people to, you know, back to voting, but I'm, I'm an optimist. <laughs> I, I agree with you with that. I mean, in the end, right. Data by itself, technology by itself, analytics by itself doesn't win elections, right. It's the organizers. I think, one thing that we're very excited about is giving the organizers another tool uh, for the incredible, important work that they are doing and will continue to do and that will make the difference in this race. So we're excited to be able to make uh, a contribution to that. And again, very thankful to Paige for um, for making this all of this happen. Um, you know, I saw someone ask the question about would we say the data support uh, strategy of increasing Biden's positives? versus just increasing Trump's negatives. And for me, it's sort of like a yes and in this case. And this model, that's the exciting thing to me, is to begin to have some direction. Yes, we need to remind these voters of who Trump is. Uh, and 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 there's clearly some work to be done there. And we have to remind uh, these voters of the incredible work that President Biden has done, that he has been an excellent president and has a good track record to work on. And so again, to have this tool to help us prioritize. Um, the other great thing about this, and this is, and I forgot to mention this up front, but it's on the slide that's, that's showing the last slide. All these, these models will not just be on the usual places that you have the voter file, but uh, we are just launching the Target Smart Media Buying Platform, a digital ad buying platform. And all of these models will be loaded in there to be loaded against any sort of targeted digital or um, targeted television ad, and we'll be able to get a lot of data back from that that will continue to improve these models. So sorry to go a little bit off topic there, but that that was just something I forgot to mention and that I'm equally excited about. Thanks, Tom. Danny, did you have anything you wanted to add about uh, what do we do with this information? Sure, not not a whole lot new uh, after all the great things everyone else in the call said, but I, I, I guess what I would just say is that that when voters tell us what they're thinking, we should believe them. Um, that that doesn't mean that a survey in February of an election year uh, is the same thing as what's going to happen in November of that year. It's certainly not, but people are telling us that they are uh, unhappy with uh, with the options they have available and. 
Uh, as much as we might be frustrated by that and say, you should be happy, Joe Biden's a great president. Uh, we That's not enough in and of itself. We have to give them a reason to, to actually choose us. Um, and I'm sure that'll involve a lot of uh, telling people that choosing Donald Trump is uh, a major risk that could happen if they stay home or vote third party. But uh, some of it has to also include convincing people that Joe Biden and the Democrats really do have their back and really are looking out for our future. Let me jump in here because I think uh, there's an important point to make, which is, at, but it's been mentioned earlier, but just to reinforce it, this process is iterative and we'd like to do the survey and the focus groups to understand what these people are thinking in a more granular way and just focus on this community in terms of our survey research. But down the line, what our hope is that we will be able to develop state specific models because that really will help people in each state in a very unique way and so that's our that's our dream great Paige, was there anything else you wanted to add for the final question or about the project or things going forward before we close it out just a thanks for uh, being here and this is the kind of project that innovating for the public good wants to pursue something that will be useful you know, in an immediate cycle, but have long-term consequences as well. And to build a new tool that will be basically a utility going into the future. Thanks for doing this, Paige. Okay, I think, I think that's it. Paige, would you, would you like to have the last word? Uh, thank you, Target Smart. Thank you, Jeff. And um, we have a lot of work to do. So let's get going.